<laughs> so we could actually dive into the minutia of an oft talked about support topic if it doesn't take us too far afield, Andrew. Go, Chip. So we get asked a lot, why is it that our UI is in local time? So when you're logged into the application, everything that you see is in your local time and reports and tickets come out in UTC military time. Have you got, have, have you guys all noticed that? Yes. Yep. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> and it'd be great to have that be click here to adjust the time, but I assume it's because you need a frame of reference that's constant for across the world. Well, exactly. I can understand keeping in the background, but we should have the option present the report in local time. So uh, that's the one thing we can't do, Gary. We can give you the option to present the UI, the browser-based UI in UTC um, and 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 or military, you know, twenty-four hour time. But we actually can't give you the option to present a report in local time. Why? Because then you're modifying the content, right? You're modifying the you're, you're modifying the underlying um, context of when something happened, and she, since you don't know when that where that report was going, um, number one, we leave it in UTC. But the other thing is, um, we can't convert a PDF into or a, or a bunch of data in the field in the local time. So let me once ask you: Could we add a column? No. We, well. I mean, I'm sorry, we can't, yeah, we can't convert into, no, we still can't convert it into local time because we don't know where it's, where it's going or, you know, who's printing it. The, when, when you take that action to dump it out, um, we don't grab the browser time any longer gotcha. because it's no longer relevant to the user who's going to be looking at it. So the only way to make it contextually correct is in UTC. Or we add that field to a particular client record and then you start to reference it and add a column. That would be more laborious than. Yeah, that would be an enhancement. I don't think you guys want us working on, to be honest with you. I'll bet you have yeah. big fish that you want us to fry. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, that's the analytical me kind to say, but we could. <laughs> <laughs> but we could. We go through that every day. <laughs> Tell you what, if you guys are all amenable to increasing your price by 5X on a per user basis, we can get right on that. Is everybody talking? I don't hear anything. <laughs> Something about 5X and all of a sudden costs. I'm, I'm, I'm now saying, what's the topic? Yeah, because we, then we could easily, you know, support another developer just to work on that specific topic. <laughs> all right. How do you always have to prove a point? I don't get it. <laughs> all right. So. Um, let's get into a few things right off the bat. Number one, um, Michelle, I think we have a poll. Is that fair? That is very fair. And I'm going right. to right now. And then number two, um, in kind of picking up where we left off, um, I had, if you're, if you weren't on last, uh, week's call or I was, you know, kind of just struggling with why isn't everybody monitoring, um, every M365 environment, we talked about that. Um, we talked about the objections. We talked about, um, you know, the challenges, um, et cetera. And so I asked the team at SaaSlarts, well, I, I got to imagine you have MSPs that are, that built it into their stack, have deployed it, of course. So today we're going to do a partner spotlight with one of those. And it's Kevin Kilpatrick of Kilpatrick IT. Kevin, thanks. I really appreciate you joining us. Sure. Awesome to have you. Uh, awesome to have you with us. And I thought it was interesting. And I know you're going to tell us a little about your, you know, yourself and your background. But when I went, you know, and spoke with you, and then looked at your website, I'm like, it, it, to me, it was kind of telltale of why you're kind of passionate about about this, just based on your history um, in the cloud, and um, you know how long you've been doing it for. So. Um, I know we're going to be talking about that. So with that, Kevin, thanks. Welcome. And can you share a little about yourself and your organization? Uh, sure. I started the organization 15, going on 16 years ago um, in the face of worldwide economic collapse in 07. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, uh, along the way, we got into cloud pretty early on. So um, started with hosting desktops and servers. Uh, at a data center uh, and went from there. So um, 
been doing it for quite a while and have been reasonably successful at it. So that's awesome. Thing. That's awesome. Jim reminds me of Independence IT all of a sudden when I hear hosting desktops and, you know, right, that's, we, that's where we started. <laughs> so, there you go. Independence IT. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the places we we ended up at anyway. Yeah. So Kevin's been with us now, two companies. Yeah. Okay, okay very cool. Um, so, you know, Kevin, when you say you've been out cloud for a while and you started out, um, you know, doing you know infrastructure, can you kind of take us on the path or the continuum of what things you were doing in the cloud? Did you have your own data centers? Or are you, you know, using Colo? Um, where are you today in that journey? And kind of maybe just to walk us through that. Um, we started at a company called Phoenix Nap in Arizona, where uh, we could buy virtual machines. Um, that was a pretty expensive delivery model, though, because we needed individual domain controllers for every account and all that kind of stuff. So then we ended up um, moving to a data center in Michigan. We're still there at uh, US Signal. Mm. Um, so we host a lot of stuff over there with uh, now NetApp uh, software. Um, so we do a bunch of hosted desktops. We're ultimately going to probably move out of most of that. And now we've started uh, a presence in Microsoft Azure. And we have a product called Nerdio in the front of Azure, which works really well for us. So yeah, it's been quite a journey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm curious, you know, with the hosted desktops and all, just uh, I, this wasn't even planned, but I'm just curious with, with when the pandemic hit, Mm -hmm. what, what kind of contingencies did you have in place? Was it challenging at all? Um, maybe kind Fortunately, of yeah, most of our accounts, we already had remote access built in for our users. Um, we use a product called Splashtop for that. Um, so we didn't have a lot of transitionary uh, aches and pains on that front. Um, and a lot of our clients, we had already moved into uh, the 365 suite. Um, so as a, as a matter of fact, I had my DISTI call, I don't know, it was a year or two ago. And they said, gosh, we're getting all your desktop business, but we're not seeing any servers. It's like, that's because there aren't any anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so our client base now is large. We do still have a lot of on-prem servers. Uh, ultimately, through attrition, they're going away from most of our clients. Um, and we're either moving them into Azure or... Um, SharePoint with the 365 line. Interesting. What what kind of clients can you give us a sense of your clients? Like you meaning like any particular? Is it horizontal? Um, do you have any regulated? You know what do you focus on? Yeah, I mean, it, like a lot of MSPs, I think uh, professional services were pretty. You know, um, lawyers, accountants, those sorts of people. Yeah. Um, we have a pretty good construction vertical. I have a background long ago in construction. So I kind of get those guys. Um, but other than that, it's pretty horizontal, a little bit of manufacturing, some retail, some uh, healthcare. So okay, everything. Okay. So, so definitely, so definitely some security related regulations there, whether it's PCI, sure. HIPAA, et cetera. Got it. Yeah. Um, we have a pretty good cadre of machinists who make widgets for defense contractors. So those are, oh, okay. So there's a lot of regulatory some, stuff going there with DFARS. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, fun, fun times there. Um, um, so you mentioned, you know, you were pretty much into M365 at the at the pandemic. Did you guys ever host Exchange and, you know, tell us? We about never that. did. Um, yeah. We hosted email with, uh, oh, shoot, no, the name escapes me. They were a huge email Not host. Media. It was Intermedia. Thank you very much. Yes, ah, there we go. Okay. So we used Intermedia for our early Exchange hosting. Uh, and then migrated all those clients eventually over to the 365 product directly. Um, okay. Because Intermedia started going 365. It's like, well, why don't I just mm. do my own? Um, mm. So we went that route. Yeah, very cool. Um, glad to hear you're not with Rackspace. As, I know. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay. So what about security services? Because you have regulated clients, talk to us about, you know, just in general, you know, how you look at security, how you, you know, is it based on, you know, framework by client and industry? Is there a standard um, package that you look at controls and, you know, have a baseline? Um, let's just start there and then let's move into the cloud. I'd love to know kind of how you look at things. Sure. Um, for us, security obviously is paramount, always has been. 
Um, and we don't give our clients the option to pick and choose the security products that we include for them. Um, we have the same package across our entire client base. I don't have additional security features that they can pay extra for. Um, it's my opinion that if a client contracts with us as an MSP, they assume that we are taking care of 100% of their security need. And we can't do that unless we purchase the products and install the products um, that help us achieve that goal. So um, we have EDR, MDR, um, SES alerts for monitoring on the 365 side, um, email security. Um, so we have a pretty wide array of security products that we manage for our clients. So um, talk to us about like, let's just say, for example, let's just pull Pam out of, out of the out of thin air. You know, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, almost every single cyber insurance. Yeah. And I'm keeping this away from cyber from SAS alerts on purpose. We'll come back. That's to okay. That. But you know, every every cyber insurance questionnaire almost right now is is asking about Pam and certainly a, playing a big you know role in it. Let's just say you make the decision. Hey. We need Pam across the board. You know, here's where I'll draw it back to SAS alerts. Are you going to just say, hey, we need this? Um, not only do we need it internally, uh, I'm assuming you put your own oxygen mask on first, but, right. you know, we need it. Um, are we going to eat it, uh, in essence, Kevin, until time of renewal and say, hey, look, we added these things into your stack and now instead of, you know, your hard cogs being, I'm making it up, 50 ahead, it's now 60 ahead, and therefore your end user price is now 180 versus 165. How, how is that, how does that work? Um, yeah, so historically, that's how we've done it. So we'll add the product across the client base. We'll notify the client that we've done it, of course, because we need to keep them up on our value to them, right? Um, and then on renewal, there'll be a price increase typically. I mean, it depends okay. on the on the product and how much it costs and where we're at. But, okay. Um, so typically, that's how we'll do it, or we'll have an out of band price increase if it's a really large sum. Okay. On a perceived basis, yeah. Got it. Maybe hypothetically, maybe you know, it has to do with logging, and now all of a sudden we got big sim sock storage, and you know, you can't just eat that. As exactly. It. So those products, yeah, we'd have to, we'd have a out of band increase on those. Okay. So why don't we talk just um, about SAS alerts because the objections and Jim, maybe you can keep me honest here, but the objections. So one, I'm going to ask Kevin first how he did it, why he did it the way he did. And then Jim, the objections are typically, you know, I need to sell it to my customer or um, can you help me with a few of the others when we get there? But mm -hmm. st start, start us off, Kevin, how you approached it and why you approached it the way you did. And um, we had had a number of issues with uh, client accounts getting hacked at Microsoft. Um, as much as we tell them, please turn on multi-factor authentication. Please let us do this for you. It's free. They don't do it. Um, so on that regard, we needed a better monitoring product for the 365 uh, for us because it's too onerous to do it on an individual tenant basis. There's no way you can, I don't think, uh, effectively monitor all that stuff. So we thought SAS Alerts was a great product when uh, it was presented to us and we decided to add it to our entire stack. Um, it's given us great insight and prevented some potentially disastrous things from happening. Um, you know, hey, you know, Joe Smith over here just got, his account just got logged into from Upper Slobovia. Um, is that okay? Well, no, it's not okay. Joe Smith's <laughs> here in New Hampshire. <laughs> so let's find out what's going on and see if maybe Joe Smith's in, on vacation in Upper Slobovia, right? right. So that has a, a couple of effects. Number one, uh, it gets us on early knowing that the account has been compromised so that we can remediate the issue quickly. Um, however that may have happened because somebody got Joe Smith's credentials from somewhere. Um, but anyway, and then it also has the added benefit of us calling Joe Smith and saying, hey, we got your back. We noticed somebody logged in from Upper Slobovia. Is that you? So most of our accounts that we have called with those kinds of alerts are pretty impressed, frankly. Um, and it gives us the option or gives us, makes us stickier, I guess you could call it. Mm -hmm. It's a great, great cool customer relation tool. 
Yeah, and Andrew, <clears throat> one of the things that frustrates me the most in, in this role with Sessler's is when <clears throat> the exact opposite of what Kevin just said. Kevin takes this as an opportunity to demonstrate the value that he's providing to his customers every day by letting them know when something's wrong or potentially wrong and, and highlighting that. I can't tell you how many people I talk to from an MSP perspective that just don't want to have to deal with it. They're like, you know, I, I don't, I don't have the time to deal with that type of activity or, or more alerts. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and for those folks, I wonder why they're in this business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think part of, yeah, go, please Kevin. I'm just going to say, if you, <clears throat> if you're in this business and you stick your head in the sand and hope that it all goes away, it's not going to go away, obviously. Um, and the other <clears throat> side of that sword is now your client's compromised and who they're going to call and who they're going to blame. They're going to talk to you and they're going to say, why didn't you detect this? Why didn't you tell me? Why was somebody able to log into my bank account and steal all my money because I had a list of passwords in Outlook? Really happened once. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so wow. that's the calls you're going to get, right? So yeah. <clears throat> not good. Yeah. yeah what, what's really interesting, and I'm just, I'm, I'll put the, I love comments on this from not only you, Kevin, but again, our 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 audience. Um, I'm going to show the Microsoft Digital Defense Report shortly. Um, and uh, shameless plug, Mackenzie Brown from the Microsoft Dart will be on the cyber call, not this coming Monday, but the following Monday going through the report with us. Um, but what's really interesting, and I'll show it is, again, like Microsoft highlights, like ransomware, where we put a lot of our money, like EDR, EDR, ransomware, ransomware, ransomware. I get it. I'm not discounting it. But when you look at what leads to ransomware, it's a lot of what you just pointed out, Kevin. It's credentials, right? Almost always. You know, there's a reason initial access brokers mm. are becoming such a big deal on the dark web and where everything starts. I mean, that that's all they do, right? Is they they're threat actors that steal credentials and then allow other threat actors to buy them at mass scale and go execute ransomware against it. But talk to, you know, any, any thoughts on that? Because literally it's like, to me, it's like, um, I, I, I've, I've got my arm chopped off, right. Or I've got this deep wound, but I don't want to deal with that. Right. I just, I, you know, I, 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 I want to deal with the things that might happen because of that. So anyway, does that, does that make any sense? Yeah, headed at the source rather than the symptom, I suppose, right? Um, right. Yeah, I mean, in our opinion, if, if we can nip this in the bud, mm -hmm. um, then we have potentially stopped a ransomware incident or um, other bad things happening on the, at the client's on their yeah. client stuff, right? So, um, and it, Microsoft isn't going to send you an alert typically. I suppose we could probably configure something. But it, um, if somebody logged in from Laos, right, or whatever it was, if it's a legit login, it's a legit login. Nobody's paying attention, right? Yeah. Because um, nothing was actually hacked. So it's it gets yeah. us in sooner. I mean, you, you can, you know, it should correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, but this is where, you know, you need an automation person and somebody keeping up on all the APIs. I mean, you can go tenant by tenant and set it up, you know, um, geolocating and, and, and uh, out of band, you know, logins and, you know, conditional access policies in each account. But Chip, correct me if I'm wrong. It's, it, it become, if you have one company, maybe, but it becomes untenable now when you start dealing with more? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the higher volume you're dealing with in terms of customer organizations, the more unwieldy it gets to manage it. And um, even if you are managing it, let's say you have a process in place where you're going to set up everybody the same way, you open yourself to mistakes that they're not going to be configured the same from one to the next, from one mm -hmm. tech to the next, somebody gets distracted, forgets something on the checklist, and they don't you know, enforce MFA, or they don't set up conditional access rules. So. Um, our, you know, part of our job is to try and simplify that and make it easier for the MSP to standardize, you know, what their monitoring rules are going to look like across all of the organizations um, and, and enforce 
consistent behavior. Yeah. Hey, Andrew, I can uh, I can shovel my sidewalk in my driveway with a spatula, but it's probably not the best use of my time. Right. Fair. Fair. Right. So, so well, as a small organization, I mean, we've got, there's 15 of us in my whole organization, so mm -hmm. it's difficult for us to have that much, that kind of time. Yeah. Did you, did you, so with, with going back to SAS Lords, did you just initially eat it? You know, Hey, it's 80 cents. I'll eat it. And then I'll bake in the renewal. And if so, like, can you talk about a little bit under the sausage? Like here's 80 cents in hard cogs. How did you monetize that eventually? How did you, how did you eventually package that? Yeah. Sure. I mean, it's a, uh, don't tell the people at SAS Alerts. It's one of the most affordable products we use. Um, with the biggest bang for the buck so Don't tell us yeah exactly did you hear that um, oh you're getting it for free now is that what i'm hearing <laughs> yeah, that's right. uh anyway bottom line is for us yeah we ate it um we knew we were going to have some price increases coming out um shortly so we just built it into the price increase um so for us and part of the roi part of the equation is the roi right so how much potential time am i saving by having a product like this that saves me from maybe a ransomware event or from you know just general angst with my clients um, or anything like that. I mean, a single ransomware event, how many hours is that gonna cost you? 50, 100, uh, more, I don't know. So it's a, the potential savings is huge. You'll never be able to calculate it, but it's there. Yeah, yeah. What's, what, I, what I love what you just said, Jim, I'll let you talk in two seconds. Yeah. I know Pat, Patrick Cranston's with us. And last week we spoke about, promise this will make sense in a second, Kevin, because you weren't on last week's call, but what was awesome is Patrick ended up landing some new clients that were in the graphic arts uh, field that traditionally wouldn't have cared about security, but a third party, probably regulated, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Patrick, but some third party said, hey, if you're going to do business with us, you need X, Y, and Z. And therefore, it really wasn't about the security. It was about the business, right? That's why the security went in. And it's cool to hear you talk about it from a business perspective. Because you did nothing you just said, Kevin, had to do with technology. It had to do with your reputation. <laughs> it had to do with your dollar, dollars and cents. If this ransomware event happens, A, my customer is going to think I'm responsible. B, you know, 80 hours in, what's my time? Um, it was cool to just hear it from what you just said from business. Jim, you're in a, maybe- Well, I was just going to say, Kevin was one of our early adopters. You know, okay. we haven't even been at this for two years yet, but Kevin came on pretty quick. And we have a lot of really great customer quotes, but Kevin's is probably the best. <laughs> so for people that don't know, and are you familiar with the, the Frank's Red Hot ad? Like yeah, they're, not they're, at the ad, but no other. Their, their slogan, you know what their slogan is? No. Nah. Frank's Red Hot. I put that show in everything. So <laughs> Kevin adapted that and said, SAS alerts, I put that show in everything. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Um, I don't know why you haven't quoted me in any of your website stuff or anything. No, it's on. You know, oh, it is? I, I did a whole it. social media post on it. It's got a Oh my gosh, okay. I'll yeah. have to go look at I'll that. I'll send it to you. I think we need a new That's t-shirt. my favorite one. <laughs> I think we need a new t-shirt, Michelle. T-shirt, yeah. exactly. Jonathan, <laughs> write it down. Send me one. <laughs> so do you rank, you know, or where do you rank, I guess, M365 in critical applications or mission criticality to your your customers' environments these days? It's, I mean, it's at the top of the list for most of them. Um, I mean, back when I first got into this business, email was the killer app, it still is. I mean, it, you can't live without email now, um, not in the business world. Right. Um, and for many of our clients, um, they're, they're storing their data there too, right? So um, the bulk of our clients use uh, business premium SKUs. So we use Intune and so forth um, to manage their infrastructures. There's no domain controller. So all domain control comes from uh, 365. So yeah, it's, it's the turning, turning point application, I guess. That's awesome. Um, from a prospect side, when you're in prospect calls, how are you tying things like identity, 
things like, you know, multi-factor to how they make business, how they make money, uh, you know, when they're, you know, do you ever get pushback? I'm sure you do. Yeah. But like, how do you, how do you do it? And, and what do you say? Well, MFA, as it happens yesterday, we've just decided to make MFA mandatory for our clients in 365. Um, I don't think we'll lose anybody over it. Some people will be a little upset about it, I think. Um, and we'll have to jump through a hoop or two to make sure everybody's capable of doing it. But um, the compromises that occur with these products, um, MFA, while not perfect, is going to prevent 95% of any kind of compromise, right? So um, why wouldn't you do it? Uh, from a client standpoint and how this affects their business and how these products are um, important to their business, um, it's not just the 365 suite, it's their other cloud-based products too. Um, what are they using? How efficient can it make them as a business? What's their ROI on these products and our services? So if they're um, a multi-location business, I mean, we have quite a few clients now that since COVID have gone completely remote, closed their office, they're done, see you later. Um, 365 really makes that possible. Because other before 365, there was not an easy way to do that. Sure, mm -hmm. you could have a cloud server. I could do hosted desktops, fine. Um, but for the email piece and the rest of it, it just makes life a lot simpler for a lot of our clients. And it's inexpensive for what it is as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So it's uh, yeah, right up there. <laughs> Very cool. That was awesome, Kevin. Um, any closing thoughts? And does anyone have questions for Kevin? I got one real quick, if you don't mind. Sure. We get a lot of pushback uh, trying to mandate uh, two-factor authentication as far as customers, um, you know, with their uh, users having to use their personal phones. Um, that's an issue that they bring up. So how are you getting around that? Um, we're actually researching that right now. I'm trying to find uh, an affordable dongle device, keys, like a know, keychain. Yeah, yeah. Way to go, right? keys. Keys, but there, there is a cost there too, you know, I mean, because you, you want to yeah. have two of them. You don't want to just have one. You want to have a backup. Right. Yeah, you need to be able to get in. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got some extras. There you go. <laughs> but they're not horribly expensive, I don't believe. Um, About $45 a piece for that. Yeah. 10 five, you know. um, so from a client standpoint, I usually equate it to what's the other stuff you buy for your users? Right. You bought them a desktop, you bought them a monitor and a keyboard and all the other stuff that goes along with that. You're buying them 365. Um, maybe you're buying them health insurance and workers comp and all this other stuff that goes on. So 45 bucks one time or $90, $90, right? If you're buying two of them is a relative drop in the bucket to guarantee your security. So okay. There are no guarantees in security, but at least to yeah. enhance your security. Mm -hmm. By the way, since you mentioned YubiKeys, are, are you seeing uh, any um, uh, MFA um, uh, like uh, push fatigue, uh, I, I, you know, uh, uh, as far as a, a tactic? Have you oh, guys we, get, we get pushback from customers that saying that employees, I'll go work somewhere else if I have to do this because it's just a pain, you know, um, that's big pushback. Um, I, I mean, with the Microsoft product, at least it's once every 30 days, right? So you don't have to, it's not a daily, you got to type the thing mm -hmm. sort of deal. Um, we also recommend password manager, managers. Um, sure. We, we recommend RoboForm now because RoboForm will give, I shouldn't, I don't know if I'm allowed to plug somebody else's product here. But anyway, it's- uh, They don't compete with us. I don't, yeah, and I don't get any kickback. So uh, bottom <laughs> line, it's, uh, and there may be others too, but RoboForm will store the MFA key. Um, so you can, it'll type your username, your password and your MFA all out of a single app without typing anything, which is really slick. Dave, they, they literally, the, what was the objective? They'll say, if my users have to do this, say it again. Well, one of the companies we are pushing, you know, two factor to, um, a lot of the field employees and stuff like that, it's a construction company. So we're dealing with a bunch of con construction guys, you know, they're like, you know, um, now I'll go work tomorrow. I don't want to do it. Yeah. Is that, so no, is that what the owners are saying or the, the employees? The employees. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's pushback. Yeah. Yeah, that's serious pushback. <laughs> yeah. 
gosh. But no, a lot of the people, you know, they understand the importance of it, you know, and it's just a matter of there's issues with, you know, people using their personal phones, switching to UV keys, the cost involved there. So we're just looking at everything we can, you know. So Dave, if I could follow up on just a like a technical deep dive on that pushback. So construction frontline workers are they're generally going to be hitting from a mobile device, right? From a phone or a tablet. Yeah. Like have you have you tried demonstrating for them that once they, you know, if they install the Microsoft Office local outlook, which is probably what we're talking about for a frontline yeah. worker, it's never going to prompt them after they initially sign up. Like it it picks up right. the you know, a token, it stores a token on that device and uses the IME number as kind of an automatic second factor. Right. But it never, like, ever prompts them again. Did they, uh, right. are they aware of that? Yes. It's not, it's not just for that. It's like for uh, having to uh, remote hey, into their, this work, call right to their office. I'll be done. Okay. You know, it. it's not just for the Microsoft, you know. So, so they, they also use like a remote desktop to, to come mm -hmm. into the office. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah together, that's together. where they get it more frequently. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. That's just one, you know, but um, everybody else seems to not be freaking out that bad about it. But then there still is the, you know, if you have employees using their personal phones, do you give them a stipend? You know, you know. It's or do you provide phones for all the employees? You know. Dave, it's like one of those things you want to say is like, hey, what if I told you one of my clients just had $300,000 wired out of their account because they yeah. didn't have MFA? What would you say then? Mm. Yeah. And we've seen it. We've had, you know, uh, business email compromises too. And, you know, like, uh, how do you? I could, I could say we have had a couple of accounts and it wasn't the MFA pushback. It was pushback on another security issue, the problem or product and add on that we had to do. Um, and we mandated it because I didn't want to accept the liability. Um, right. And a couple of clients said, well, I'm not going to do it. And I said, well, you'll have to find another provider. I'm sorry. And they didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> we want to keep it, everybody. It, no, of course we do. Because they're hard to get. I get it. Um, yeah. But it, I think at the end of the day, it showed them how serious I was and how important right. this was to them that I didn't want to accept liability when they got hacked because they mm -hmm. would. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and I, you can't be hardline like that with everybody. I get it, but yeah. um, maybe. One yeah. But it's a great point. We have something called the covered extension notification, which is basically an opt out for MSPs that are going out to their customer base and say, Hey, look, for your protection and ours, we're now going to start offering this. If you don't want it, you can opt out. <clears throat> The opt-out rates are very, very low, like 5% for every MSP that's done that with us. I'm hearing a common theme from everyone on this call, and that is how do we communicate the value ultimately of all these security offerings? And what is the ramifications that are taken by the client if they don't accept it? Um, or that change is difficult and it is uh, a paradigm. I'm, I'm working through this whole process now about how do I communicate changes at a high enough level um, that they can appreciate that they don't need to know all the details, but these are just the things that have to be done. And, I, uh, and that's something I think we miss in a lot of these calls because we're at such a detail level, but ultimately helping us com uh, develop communication back at a high enough level that it relates to the client. Um, you know, I, I liked the um, cyber defense matrix because it had a word cloud. And I thought about that for a little bit. That's, you know, most people think of technology and security and, and, and what compliance as that mm -hmm. word cloud, right? Mm -hmm. And helping them be able to piece together a sentence that says, this is ultimately what we're trying to do is communicate that. And to me, that would be a, a helpful piece with SAS alerts to help us build that communication such that um, it makes sense to the non-technical people and that they understand it's just like the bank. You have to put in a two-factor authentication today. You have mm -hmm. to do this for your everyday app, you mm -hmm. know, or you're at risk. Mm -hmm. Jim, yeah, I think one of the things that is, I think we're probably seven, nine, nine to 12 months away from the industry seriously helping us with that because Andy, how many of your customers go and get 
cyber insurance today? Not many. They're doctors, a couple, but most don't get cyber insurance. I have it for me, right. but that's that's the reality is that they have, uh, I, I was even talking with a couple, they have expensive um, ophthalmic equipment yeah. and they don't even have a security alarm in some of their rooms. And I'm just kind of going, really? I'm mm. amazed. Right. That is crazy. Because I, I, I think within nine to 12 months, anyone that wants cyber insurance is going to, this is the type of product. I'm not saying exactly SaaS source, but SaaS security so you're gonna monitoring, you're going to have to have it. Yeah. Certainly and, and any MSP that wants cyber insurance is going to have to have it. Yeah. It's yeah. like they're all asking for EDR now and they didn't care before. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I think, but I think there's a way and we are, we're doing the um, probably one of the best in the business on Monday's cyber call. His name is Brian Blakely of Coast and Cyber on having business conversations. He owns several MSPs. Yeah. He's a security guy by trait. Um, and we're going to do um, risk-based um, uh, scenario, um, risk-based um, scenario um, conversations with, so the, everything we're going to be talking about, we're going to be saying, okay, here's a scenario, MFA, how do you convey business impact to a, to not, how, yeah. how is it business speak, Andy? Forget technology. How do you take a risk-based scenario and communicate it in business terms to a business owner, to a C-level, right? right? To get action. Cause, and that's what he's a master at. Good. Um, well, just, when, are you, when are you doing that? Cyber calls every Monday at one. No, no. I, I said, when is he speaking next to this that Monday. point? This Monday. Monday. Coming up. This, yeah. Or, or the one that just happened. No, nope. it's coming, coming up. This coming okay, up. great. Thank you. I'll be there then. Yeah. Is that for SAS alerts? The Monday no, call? but no, this is a good opportunity um, to talk about the webinar we do have coming up with Spencer Pollock. Is it yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm going to give you, can you, in, in Zoom, can you add like an attachment everybody can have? Can, can you put it in I the can, chat? I can send the link to the. Um, can you uh, put it in some? Oh, wait, here it is. I want, I'm going to give everybody an early holiday gift. Give me one second. Throw it in chat. Yeah. Yeah. So if I look, it goes SharePoint, Box, Drive, Micro, Dropbox. Why can't I? Why can't I? My computer. That's weird. Anyway, so Spencer Pollock's one of the top, um, one of the top reach attorneys uh, in the country, and we've got a webinar with him for Sassler. So I got him to commit to us. There's there's the uh, URL in there, and so he's going to share with you what he does on a regular basis, um, and specifically, um, we're going to be talking M um, three sixty five. So a client gets breached or again let's say an incident let's not say breach they have an incident um it gets called into cyber insurance cyber insurance's first call is going to be to the breach council he's one that's on many panels they're going to call him in if there's an msp involved which there always is um he'll walk through how he's going to cross examine an msp on um you know, what would be arguably at minimum a shared responsibility model, but um, arguably, you know, table stakes these days for, you know, what we should be monitoring. So, um, so yeah, please attend that. It's great. He's, he's fantastic. <laughs> I wish, yeah. by the way, and, and I've got to, and, and, and that is our webinar, but to clarify, everyone should know that, you know, if you don't, Andrew's got his cyber call every Monday, one o'clock Eastern, some of the best content on the planet specific to MSPs and security. So I, I make that call anytime I can. Thanks, Jim. I've got a one of his, he was the early holiday present I wanted to give everybody is he created a PDF with, it's got 10, it's called the comms, do's and don'ts when there's an incident. Um, and it's a phenomenal uh, uh document. Michelle, if I got it to you, can you get it to everybody? Hello? I don't know if I can attach it. Uh, if I okay. can't, I can, I can email it to everybody on the call. Okay. I'm going to send that. Let me, because uh, I will go to part two here. I just want to give everybody a, a nice holiday treat. It's a phenomenal document. Uh, so let me do this for you, Michelle, and we'll see if we can get it up there. It's coming to your inbox right now. 
All right. So the next part of today, I'm going to put a URL in there for everybody, and that is to talk about the Microsoft Digital Defense Report. Yeah. Anybody familiar with it? Hey, Andrew, before we do that, can we see the poll? Sure. I want to see what everyone said about the poll. Sure. Okay, so I had issues looking at the poll again, so I did download it. Okay. Uh, we had 22 responses, and they, they were all, yeah. said 100%, yeah. Yeah. 100%? Okay. Yep, everybody well, said yes. So we're talking to a lot of Kool-Aid drinkers here. We need we need everyone to spread the word. Because I bet, right, if we ask that question to the, call it 150,000 MSPs worldwide, it wouldn't even be close to that percentage. I bet it would be like 60%. I like how the executive summary is 11 pages long on the Microsoft document. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah let's just share. You expect anything else from Microsoft? <laughs> well, I, I'm just a, a processing that the challenge ultimately is communicating the just the summary points to a business owner that says, "Guys, you want to read the detail here, you know," um, and maybe that's a, a supporting way to handle this. And even the executive summary, Andy, I'd argue, you know, for most business owners is, most, is a little yeah, bit too is much. too much. So what I did is I, um, let me know if you guys can see my, I'm just flipping screens. Yep, yes. point. So what I wanted to do is kind of walk through, um, and it's funny because Kevin, when you, we were talking about this earlier, this is where my head went. And Microsoft, like I said, points this out. And these are things that I'm, you know, again, if you guys feel this is useful, I kind of took the most, the most important things that I think we could convey back to an owner. I'm not saying there's not more in there, but a lot of it's on nation state. They talk about the Ukrainian, you know, it starts off, off with that. But this is where, you know, yeah. we can kind of walk through with one of our, our customers or prospects and, and speak to them about the language of what an attacker does, what they're after and what they do with it and how it impacts their business, right? So, you know, Here's, here's where we can show them and talk to them. Look, there's no one on the planet, arguably, that sees possibly Google, but I don't even think they do because it's mostly a very different thing, way in which they see it. But no one in the world sees threats through a better lens than Microsoft. And, you know, they talk about here what, um, what the threat actors are after. And so you'd say that, you know, the, um, the, the customer, look, do you have antivirus? You know, because that's what they're going to think. They're not going to know EDR probably, right? Do you have some kind of protection on your computer, right? And they're all going to probably say, yeah, of course I do. Say, do you, do you, what if I told you that that's not preventing ultimately what's going to allow them to get in, right? And we start to talk to them about the importance of, you know, monitoring what they're after so that we can see if a threat actor is attacking the impact it's going to have like you told me that you know this piece of your business you know this system that uses authentication through azure or some type of an identity is you know responsible for 80 percent of your revenue let me walk you through what happens does that make sense by the way you know, I, I think, Andrew, there's another point that may be subtle here, that a lot of people have private emails outside of the organization, and they're viewing and bringing that content in, um, and those credentials can also be breached and be used to move around an organization as well. But, but you know, it, it, it's funny, Andy, you, 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 ask a, you bring up an awesome point. You ask that person, hey, let me, let me ask you a question. Do you use any of the same credentials in your corporate email as your private email? Do you use any of the same credentials in this website as that website? I mean, threat actors know that. That's what, that's what they prey on, right? Um, so that's point number one of the of it. You know, point number two, we get into. Um, uh, I wanted to show you some. Um, you know, what you could show. You know, this is a this is a night. Sorry, let me just move Zoom. Because all right, it shows like actionable insights um, to to what you can show. You know, a um, uh, a customer. Look, let 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 me let me uh, or a prospect. Let me talk to you about one of the most overlooked things that 
that we probably could find some ways to help you. And that is, you know, it comes back to inventory, right? People inventory hardware, they inventory software. You know what they really are very poor about inventory? Credentials. Yeah, accounts, right? And again, you could explain to a customer or a prospect, this is what a threat actor is hoping for. They're hoping you forget about this account. They're hoping you forget about that account. Um, uh, it goes into one of our favorite topics, which is business email compromise and the trends uh, and the amount of chaos and money that's paid out uh, year over year. Um, uh, only about, uh, um, it, it's as it says here, VEC's financial crime with an estimated 2.4 billion uh, in 2021. So we know that's only going higher. Um, and then um, uh, we talk about, we, here we go with weak identity controls. This is where we can get, Dave, we can get back into, you know, MFA, right? Again, you know, you're, yeah, you're, you're, I, I got it. Your, your construction workers don't want to do this. Again, let me, let me walk you through the implications. You're running Timberline. Is Timberline still an application out there, Dave? <laughs> For construction? <laughs> or did they change the name? So I think it's still out. Thanks. Stage 300, no. Stage 300, okay. Um, right, so, you know, how much of the business, you know, is in Sage 300? How much of the organization's revenue is ultimately derived? Your bill of materials, your ordering, your suppliers, right? And kind of just walk them through, right, what happens to, to Sage 300. Um, and then lastly, these. this is the only other one, is... Um, because it highlights, Jim, we've talked about, you know, how SAS alerts looks at not just, you know, email and credentials, but right, doesn't it look for, for a one drive for uh, moving large amounts of data and SharePoint and things of that nature? Yeah. Um, so this is where we can get into speaking about, you know, what a Thractor does in terms of exfiltration, you know, explain that in terms of a, a business owner or meaning they'll, they'll steal your data. Um, by the way, Andy, you've got a great, to me, a great stick. Hey, you're a healthcare provider, right? You know, give or take every, you know, record, you know, God forbid you're compromised. 300 bucks, what, right? How, was it about two, was it close 300 bucks a, a record, right? 300 now? Yeah. Right. And kind of do the math, right? <laughs> of, um, you know, that, so. You know, it'd be awesome is that a lot of my providers have different cloud EHRs to be able to have something like a SAS alerts plug in to an EHR so that we could say, you know, you're not changing your credentials or this is being logged in elsewhere. Those are things that aren't typically available yet. That was a wish list item. Merry Christmas. <laughs> we're good for we're good for one of those every week from you, Andy. There you go. Noted, Andy. So um, with that, uh, brief, was that helpful, that brief PowerPoint? I'm happy to share that with everybody too. Yeah. Those few slides. Mm, yeah, that, Andrew's we great. Could actually, we could actually do a webinar on that mm. and have it be part of our, um, a, a prospecting tool. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll, I'll forward it out to Michelle and have her get it to everybody. Bear with me one second. Um, Andrew, you know, when you mentioned you're sharing this, I thought it was a great idea. And then in, in concepts and that definitely proved out to be the case. I think overall, one of the messages that I want to make sure that we're conveying to our partners is, you know, we, we now have 650 MSPs. That's a lot in two years, as you know, but it's still a small, small fraction of the entire market. And that means that you guys have a competitive advantage in the marketplace that you you should be leveraging as much as you possibly can. We want to help you leverage that, right? Like this, everyone know Kelly Slater, the, the famous professional surfer, he talks about that it doesn't matter if you're trying to win a, a surfing competition, doesn't matter how great a surfer you are. The most important element in winning a surfing competition is the wave. You got to pick the right wave. And you can see from this report and everything else that's out in the market, 
the security market is coming to you. This is the way, and specifically user security, right? Device security is becoming less and less important. It's all about being able to provide security around the user and being able to track the user. You have that ability. You, you caught the wave first. Do everything you can to leverage that. Yeah. Um, yeah, these, the, and, and by the way, these stories, I haven't, can I, can I just read something, Jim? Yeah, please. All right. So this is completely <laughs> wild that I just got this in my inbox. Hope you're doing okay. My business partner, Chad, his mother-in-law fell, fell for a scam that ended up her losing $100,000 to scammers late Monday, early Tuesday. She went to her bank, Wells Fargo, to see what they can do. Apparently, the funds are wired to Hong Kong Bank. If there's anything you can do, uh, the F or any FBI agency recourse that understands international wiles, but the clock's ticking, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this is re like, again, it's not real until it is. Mm -hmm. exactly. That's a person. That's not a company. So how they find you? Do you know this person? It's, believe it or not, it's an MSP whose mother. What? Right. Fell, okay. fell victim. Wow. So for people that say I'm too small. Right. Yeah, think again. It, it yeah. doesn't. And, and by the way, that's going to continue. I think that's going to evolve because our our parents are aging and they're less lucid. You know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But look, we've had CFOs fall for that. <laughs> no argument there. But we, we, you know, there's. But you can pull the heartstring a little bit with uh, aging parents. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, look, we caught it. You know. Not that long ago, two hundred thousand dollar wire that almost went out because the CFO was ready to load it up, but the MSP that was using us saw and intervened and told them it was it was a scam. Yeah, and yeah, that's that's a client that guy now has forever. That right. MSP. Wow, well, good stuff. So, good, in wrapping up today, yeah, really good stuff, um, Kevin. Um, I know you have, you were kind of like a last minute to do this. I know you have a 2 p.m. Again, want to thank you so much for your time. And it was great to meet you and happy holidays. Thank you. I enjoyed the discussion. Yeah, yeah. it was fantastic. We're going to have to send you a t-shirt and some Frank's Red Hot. Okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there you go. You can get uh, bottles of Frank's Red Hot and put a SAS label on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All sorts of good marketing stuff here, Michelle. Yeah, I actually have some hot sauce that I got from somewhere else that says light a fire under your sass. Yeah, perfect. Oh, there you go. <laughs> we'll just put our logo on it. <laughs> Jim, that should be your right of boom giveaway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, everyone who hasn't signed up for right of boom, highly, highly recommend that. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, we only have a few minutes left here. Any closing thoughts from the team at SAS Alerts or anybody on the call? Anything that you'd like to see us talk about or bring to the table, guests, et cetera? Let me know. Yeah, because Andrew can get anybody. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but you know, we had Bo so far from Black Hills. We'll have mm -hmm. Spencer on in a, in a week and a half or so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you let me know the kind of the topic that could help your business, I, I might have access to that person. Okay. I'm grateful Another great for this. Call. Yep. Another Thank good you. one. Kevin, thanks so much for coming on and being an early adopter, along with a lot of other folks on this call, by the way. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, All right. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Have Take a good care. one. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Bye. Kevin, good to see you again. Have a good weekend.